TLO, what's pop? We are on Twitch. We are live. By the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, you see a little warning screen. I don't know what this this uh, video contains. So I'm going to point you in the direction to read that. Don't forget we do got Patreon where we post five days a week. And we also got Twitch.com. You can go there and replay lives because there is stuff we watch that is only on Twitch. Uh, you can It's free. You can go there and watch it. Username's at the bottom of the screen. This is Who Killed a UAD Boss? Should I read the description? I'm some Northern Irish. All right. Talk to me first, though. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. True. Look. It's a reenactment. Or? Everybody needs to be honest with what Jim Gray was up to. And he said to me, now I know you have a bad heart. I want you to take another heart attack in front of me. I want you to die. That night, he was telling two young kids that they, they would get the gold necklace if they came to my house and they shot me. Hey. Who is Buddy in the car? Bro don't got a real little, little baggy. He's got the whole zip on him, don't he? Told him that he would most definitely not live very long, which was the case. Sadly, but truly. Certain lifestyles attract certain types of enemies. I'm glad Big Grey is gone. And maybe one day, when we're both down below, you know, we'll have a chance to sort out that unfinished business. Doubtful. Exactly one month ago tonight, Jim Gray was shot dead here outside his father's home in East Belfast. I had spoken to Jim Gray 24 hours before and he'd given no indication that he feared for his life. But his killing surprised few, except maybe Gray himself. And it's now believed that he was murdered, like other UDA bosses before him, by his own. Time had run out for the man they called the Brigadier of Bling. Why is it sparkling? The Brigadier of Bling. Oh, okay, Bling. I thought they said something else. Jim Gray had become a caricature of paramilitary criminality and excess, all over flash, from the tan to the clothes, from the jewellery to the cocaine. A mob boss, and in the best mob tradition, grooming his son, Jonathan, to follow suit. They would both die because of it. It might have been different. Look at me! his youth James Smith Gray was born in East Belfast 47 years ago he ran with the young Newton gang in the lower Newtonards road but mostly played golf off a three handicap here at the Shandon Park Golf Club Jim Gray was like myself working class East Belfast I lived in the Braniel estate uh, adjacent to that was the Clarewood estate, that's where he grew up. Uh, good family, father a gentleman. By the time Gray got married in 1979, he was working in shorts, thanks to his wife, Anne Tedford. Anne, who has been dogged by illness since, remembers when he wanted to join the police. She has spoken to us, but didn't want her face shown on camera. He was a gentleman. I suppose when you're that age, you just think, 
you get married and live happily ever after. But you don't. Was he a good husband? At the beginning, yes. Jim Gray could have meandered into obscurity or maybe golfing glory, but the lure of paramilitarism and the UDA would prove too strong. It was the largest paramilitary organisation, but riven by internal feuds. It was through these Gray was able to get close to the top of the organisation. New Year's Eve, 1982, and to Gray's delight, a son, baby Jonathan, is born. By coincidence, a leading UDA man's son was born the same day in the same ward. Jim offered him a lift home that night. After Jonathan was born, Jim and the man that was visiting his wife that Jim gave a lift home to started. So this is how he got into it. Uh, he didn't by chance ran into somebody who's his son's twin. Same birthday, I say twin. So this was his entrance to it. Like going places together, doing things together. The start of the friendship was when they met, when Jonathan was born. Was that the beginning of a different gym? No, not really. Jonathan was about two when things started going wrong. How did you know they were going wrong? I just knew the way he was behaving and... How was he behaving? Just, I knew that there was something going on, but I didn't know what it was. Robber? He was hitting licks? Anne was divorced by the time Jim Gray's involvement in the UDA became clear. In 1990, he was arrested with his new associate, Gary Matthews, after a botched robbery at this garage in East Belfast. Remarkably, this incident was about the closest the police ever came to convicting Gray for serious crime. Gray and Matthews were accused of robbing the garage owner after months of blackmailing him. Both men were caught in the act and jailed pending trial which led to Gray's first encounter with Johnny Adair. Johnny Adair, I've heard of him, as I should. The now-exiled loyalist leader, who was himself deeply involved in drugs and terrorism, already had a notorious reputation by the time they met. We did a documentary on Johnny Adair, didn't we? Or he was in one before. First time I met Jim Gray was in Crumlin Road Prison where he was on remand for robbing a garage. What was he like then? Uh, just as he was in recent times, just loud and boisterous and silly. Did he have a reputation? None whatsoever. He was unknown. I didn't know him then. Didn't know of him. So, so to me it sounds like, you know how they was giving him the description and whatnot at the beginning? Flashy earrings, you know what I'm saying? Doing this, doing that. He's always been like that. Money money just magnifies who you really are inside. You know what I'm saying? The case against Gray and his associate, Gary Matthews, eventually collapsed. Gray was free to carry on his rise up the UDA's ladder. East Belfast, UDA, uh, in particular, their leadership, were not playing an active, an active role in the fight against violent Republicans. And... When the old school, when East Belfast were stood down, there was an opportunity for Gray and his associate to move in and seize an opportunity to become who they eventually became. But it was not a bloodless path to the top. When Ned McCreary, the East Belfast brigadier, and with an infamous reputation himself, was shot dead, rumours linked Gray and another leading loyalist, Geordie Legg, to the killing. It's in rocket science to work out that once Ned was removed, um, Gray and a close associate of his uh, took over East Belfast. And that's internal, you know, and housekeeping. And I didn't agree with it. You know, I knew Ned McCreary. The funeral passed by Somebody the Avenue on over. Bar, McCreary's pub, en route to Roselawn Cemetery. Gray and his associate, Gary Matthews, would soon be running the pub and in turn the East Belfast UDA. Once the old leadership was removed, and it was replaced by Gray and his associate. The UDA leadership felt that these were a new breed, a new breed that was going to deliver for the, the UDA and East Belfast. Yeah. 
Now that he's a boss, okay, we're going to see how that's playing out, then. All right, talk to me. We're already, we're only seven minutes and 42 seconds in, and we're already at boss? Like, what is the rest about? By 1998, Jim Gray, here at the side of Michael Stone at a political rally, was known as the UDA's East Belfast Brigadier. But Spotlight has been told that he wasn't. That's him? In the white? And they cheering for him? The bro got motion. Okay, let me listen. I don't believe he was a real brigadier. I believe it was another man. And I believe that the, the Grey just put his face up front and attended meetings and gave so the impression that he was a brigadier. But to my knowledge, my understanding, he most definitely wasn't, was not the brigadier. So he's a he's puppet? Fast. It's all about self, self-promotion. And as I said, the close associate of his, who was the brigadier, who was my brigadier, I like the man and uh, have respect for him even to this day. He just led Gray f for years, you know, you want to jump in there and be seen as the public face. But uh, I'm the one who makes the decisions. I'm the one who uh, goes to the inner circle, takes the serious decisions regarding the uh, membership of the East Belfast UDA. Gray was the front man. The real leader is said to have been his associate, Gary Matthews, the man he first met in a maternity ward. Matthews is rarely seen on camera, but is pictured here at the funeral of murdered UDA leader, John Gregg. Matthews was the real power, while Gray played the role of Big Boss. Mm. Many senior loyalist figures from- You know, it's crazy, man. Some people want to be up front in the face of it, man. You know, but real G's move in silence. I mean, real, you know, you know, certain organizations and things have to have a face. And if they got to put a puppet out there to protect the brand, that's what they're going to do. That's what I'm saying. From the east of the city was seen to be present when Stone was released for good in 2000. Not Matthews. If he was there... Probably somebody more charismatic, right? Many senior loyalist figures from the east of the city were seen to be present when Stone was released for good in 2000. Not Matthews. If he was there, he kept his head down, unlike the official brigadier. That same day, Gray could be seen in all his glory, his son Jonathan beside him, faithfully mimicking his dad's getup. Gray Sr. already had another lookalike, William James Murphy, his friend and bodyguard Murph. That they had shared passions was plain. Brother, was, they look exactly alike. They could be twins. Graves' lifestyle choices were expensive. The clothes, the jewellery and holiday tan. By now, he and Matthews controlled the Avenue One pub and the Bunch of Grapes bar. But Graves' wealth was based on drugs, which he also consumed in large quantities. The money bag came out, white powder, started making lines on the table in front of me. And I guarantee you that was his downfall or a big part of it. You know what I'm saying? That one in particular, paranoia will arise. You get to doing stuff to people that don't got, that ain't do nothing to you. You get to making decisions that are based off your paranoia. And I have people turn on you. You know, I'm pretty sure that was a large part of whoever did this to him up here. I'm sitting there sweating, thinking the police are going to raid the place, and it won't be Jim Gray caught with drugs, it's Michael Stone on coke, thrown back in jail. The cocaine is said to have made Gray paranoid and also violent. Think about that in Liverpool, never paid Chelsea. Eddie Harvey, secretary of the Westbourne Glentoran Supporters Club, experienced Gray's rage. He wanted up the stairs. I said, you can't get up the stairs. So he, he, um, he hit me two digs in the face. And he said to me, now I know you have a bad heart. I want you to take another heart attack in front of me. I want you to die. Damn. But Gray didn't just threaten violence. After he fell out with Geordie Legg, the man who helped clear the way to the top for him, Legg's mutilated body was found with multiple stab wounds. I believe he was involved in uh, Geordie being taken out. One, he was frightened of Geordie. Uh, Geordie had done a few favours for him that helped him get into the position he was. Uh, Jordy... So he backdoored his mans? 
that sat passenger and really drove while you, well, he drove while you sat passenger and you let, he let you ascend to the top and cleared the way you backdoored him? It sounded like a backdoor. May have had aspirations himself from what I hear as in leadership role in East Belfast. Whatever his involvement, Gray and his gang were never held to account for the killing by the UDA's inner council. In particular, incidents like at Jory Leg, murder, they would not have explained in detail as to what, where and why it happened. They give their reasons and they didn't have to go into detail with the council and I think that was wrong. I believe that the council should have had a full report and first occasion into why such a, of, uh, an act of volunteer like Jory Leg had been murdered in such a brutal way. If Gray did have a hand in Geordie Legg's murder, he had no shame. Gray attended the funeral. He can be seen walking behind the hearse, paying his final respects. But Not gonna lie, that's common in these type of uh, organizations. But the next funeral he would attend would be that of his own son. father no one disputes that Jim Gray adored his son Jonathan the little boy who would once seem destined for another life he went to school uh, he got a grade A and was 11 plus and he chose to go to Inst he was very clever but over time, Jonathan appeared to lose interest in education. He had wanted to be a solicitor. That prospect was fading. He was in school until I realised that he was... I feel like him being a solicitor would have benefited the, the cause or the organisation more, right? Taking drugs. And I asked his father, would he take him and sort him out? But... They want to do it together. His father just pulled him deeper into it. Right. Jim Gray's lifestyle was irresistible to an impressionable teenager. He always had money. He was 17 years of age and he drove a BMW. Um, he just had everything he wanted, he got. He was a mirror image, you know, the orange tan, the white slacks and, the, you know... Looked like something from a, an Italian playboy, you know. Nice young fellow. I came in and he says, can I try that? And his father agreed and uh, he snorted some of his gear and says, well, that's wow. crap and try mine. Wow. And uh, JJ put it down and both snorted and Gray agreed. He says, yeah, you better quality your stuff. Who's your supplier? And JJ laughed and says, you. On the 12th of March, 2002, Jonathan Gray died in Thailand while on holiday with his father and friends. How he died? A statement was released on behalf of Jim Gray saying that his son had died because of a fatal reaction to an inoculation. And I just couldn't. Too many narcotics. You over there in Thailand, you don't know what's going on in their little batches and things of that name. Believe it, I just... It was a nightmare. If I... His mother wasn't allowed any role at Drill the boy. Did get to the follow. one song and see her son really boy. one last time. I just told him I loved him and I fixed his hair. I kissed him, told him I loved him. Put a white rose. Poor mom. I could never imagine, like, I would, I would never want to go. Like, you know what I'm saying? God forbid. I would. I want my child or children to outlive me thoroughly. You know what I'm saying? In the coffin with him. Jim Grace. This ill dad. Loki. Stayed outside during the short service. He appeared deeply affected by the death. The service was about to begin. Ah, oh, that's you. Salute, my boy. Said Jim, you better get on in there. And he said, Mervyn, I'm not going in. I said, why not, Jim? It's the funeral of your son. He said, I would only hear the gospel in there. He says, and I already know the truth. I don't want to hear it. And I find that uh, very sad and very telling in many ways. 
there was a revealing postscript. An autopsy report suggested the true account of Jonathan's... So did he just say he was hiding from God? That's why he ain't going there? Essentially? He said the gospel... I didn't want... Let's go back. He says, now ready, you better get on in there. And he said, Mervyn, I'm not going in. I said, why not, Jim? It's the funeral of your son. He said, I would only hear the gospel in there. He says, and I already know the truth. I don't want to hear it. The father had been near the feeling postscript. That's, that's insane. An autopsy report. You should have went in there. Maybe that gospel would have turned you around and saved your life. You hear me? It suggested the true account of Jonathan's death had been suppressed. In fact, he died after taking heroin. His father had been nearby and had been taking drugs himself. Oh, man. Okay, so they was deep into drugs. I feel like this one on the screen, like it's all right. That's but when you get down that that path of H and injectable stuff, like it, it get different. It hit a little different. Whatever private turmoil Jim Gray might have had, his gang continued their ruthless violence. The police reconstructed one vicious killing which was attributed to them. However, Gray's drug taking was beginning to affect his credibility within the UDA. When Johnny Adair was released, Gray still appeared a leading figure in the organisation. But by the time the Brigadier of Bling went to meet the Secretary of State John Reid, there was mounting anger at his lifestyle. He came across embarrassingly for the loyalist people, and in particular the people of East Belfast, that he, which he supposedly represented it. Everyone present came dressed in suits, and he came in jeans, boots, uh, pink shirt, BMW, tropical gold. I ain't even gonna cap to you, that's how I would have showed up. Everybody in suits, I'm coming comfortably. You know what I'm saying? I, I can't even say I don't feel them. Pause. The root of Gray's problem was his cocaine addiction. He wasn't even trying to hide it at sessions of the Loyalist Commission. I remember one particular meeting uh, where Jim arrived and he appeared to have um, taken some substance. I have to say, I don't know whether it was drink or drugs, but it was certainly empowering his speech. People spoke to him after that and he was asked not to come along to meetings again if he had uh, was either high on drugs or, or, or drink. Despite his erratic behaviour, Gray's luck held out when he was shot in the face in September 2000. Wait a minute. And two. He survived to walk in another funeral, that of John Gregg, shot dead in a UDA feud. Well, probably survived because he was high. Talk about it. You know what I'm saying? However, the cocaine rages continued apace. And when these were reported in the Sunday World, Gray turned his attention to the paper's northern editor. At uh, Easter 2003, a very senior policeman came to my door and said that Gray was standing in his bar and he had enough cocaine up his nose, enough snow up his nose to cover the Alps in January, the Swiss Alps in January. And he said that he wanted to be shot dead that night and he was trying to get two boys to go and do it. And the policeman asked Gray to get out of the country for a couple of weeks to let things cool off because things had been very, very hot. To let things cool off and to take my family with me. He obviously went to heed to that advice. Gray was out of control, having sold his interest in his two pubs. He now appeared intent on taking over the Westbourne Glentoran Supporters Club. I think he was trying to muscle in. Well, he had said to people, I, I'm going down and I'm <clears throat> going to take over the club. Um, I'm going to take one of the rooms off him first and then we'll go from there. It is now clear that by this time the UDA had lost patience with the Brigadier of Bling. I don't think he was taken for the UDA. I think he was taken for his own empire. I can say that honestly. By this point, the UDA leadership was also trying to distance itself from drugs. The message was pointedly clear. There's no such thing as a loyalist drug dealer. You're a loyalist or you're a drug dealer. A loyalist wouldn't be a drug dealer, and a drug dealer wouldn't allow to be a loyalist. I don't know. Finally, last March, Gray was instructed to attend a meeting of the UDA's Inner Council. 
Not only was he throwing his weight about too much, but he'd also issued death threats against two leading loyalists. He was to be charged with treason. But Gray and his associate Gary Matthews didn't attend. Instead, Gray organised a gathering of his own. He called a meeting in the bunch of grapes for his supporters to turn up in their thousands. He walked into an empty bar. I'm not gonna lie, this part sounds like an episode of Gang of Game of Thrones. When the Starks, when, when uh, the King's Hand Stark commit treason. So it sounds like. Of his cronies, you know, that he supported financially were there. Spotlight understands that Gary Matthews then told him it was all over. The man who uh, had him join the UDA uh, came in and actually said, this is all the support you can muster to hold on to East Belfast. The game's up. Jack it in. The inner council had finally moved against Gray, standing down all his gang, including Matthews. But the UDA had chosen its time carefully, only moving after Gray had lost support. He had become a liability in what he was involved in. And as Obviously, MHC he was too high. What did uh, I tell y'all earlier in this? That booger sugar ruined whatever he had going on. I'm telling you, you can't. You can claim you functional, but like it's clearly making decisions for you. You know what I'm saying? Actions were tend to become more outrageous if you believe the stories that were floating about at the time how he treated people, and uh, I believe the UDA are in the process of moving beyond the conflict and the process of transformation. And uh, Jim Gray. Everybody did. welcome, welcome, man. I'm good, I'm doing good. Appreciate everybody for asking. And fit into that, or appear that he would have fitted into that. Days after being stood down, Gray was arrested on the Belfast Dublin Road. He had £3,000 cash and a banker's draft for £10,000 in his possession. It's understood that Gray and his girlfriend, who was arrested with him, were planning to go to Spain for a few days. Not for good, at least not on this trip. Gray was subsequently charged with money laundering. Two others, including leading estate agent Philip Johnson, faced related charges, which they deny. This loose bracelet he got on. Gray was held at McGabry Prison on remand and then began receiving letters from an unlikely source. Well, it was slagging him off. Tell him how he, he was embarrassing to East Belfast and the loyalist people of Ulster. And did you invite him to reply? Or was that that he... Well, he, he replied himself. He sent me a letter. This is the letter that Gray wrote to his former enemy, who, like him, was also expelled from the UDA. Littered with spelling mistakes, it suggests Gray was barely literate, but also that he was very alone. I believe he's trying to offer his hand of friendship to mine. I believe that he realised that the world was against him and he had nowhere to hide. And I believe that he was offering his, ha his hand of friendship to mine. In the letter, Gray said that he intended to stay at his father's home in East Belfast if he got out on bail. Adair wrote back. I strongly advised him not to do that because uh, if he was doing that, I, I told him that he would be most definitely not live very long, Here which was got. the case, sadly, but truly. My advice to him was if and when you get out of prison, just pack up and leave because you're having a friend in the world. And it was evident once he was charged and remanded in custody that... Well, that's hard to hear when you was once on top and you was a figurehead, you know what I'm saying? And everybody gave you standing ovations when you walked in a room. You don't want to believe that. <clears throat> All the so-called friends and comrades who a year ago was singing his praises. But now once the chips were down, the knives were out and they were stuck on his back and twisted. In September, Jim Gray was released on bail. The police had opposed the application, citing death threats. But the judge said the courts couldn't take decisions based on what the paramilitaries might or might not do. I think we also have to appreciate that, that Mr Gray himself applied for bail, knowing that his life may be in danger. So he wanted to be released back into the public and he was obviously responsible as well for, for his own safety and for his own measures to protect himself too. One month ago tonight, Jim Gray walked out of his father's house and was shot dead. It was a clinical killing. 
And on this particular night, somewhere around uh, 8 p.m., uh, it seems that there was a prior arrangement to uh, meet with a friend and associate of his. Uh, it seems that uh, Jim Gray had wanted to um, have some of his weights back. Uh, he was keen on training. Uh, his associate and Jim Gray were standing at the back uh, of his friend's car. Uh, they were doing the exchange, the boot was opened, uh, a car approached. Uh, it seems that uh, one person got out of this car and walked towards Jim Gray. Uh, the gunman then pointed the gun at Jim Gray uh, and opened fire. It seems there were approximately three shots. Two of which hit. Man, you should have ordered some new weights offline, man. If you got a hit out on you, you should have stayed in the house. Jim Gray. Jim Gray died uh, pretty quickly uh, at the scene. The friend who had delivered the weights was Gary Matthews, his former business partner and the one time real brigadier of East Belfast's uh. UDA. He was arrested at the scene and questioned. Five other people were also detained. All were released. Spotlight now understands that members of East Belfast UDA murdered Jim Gray. He knew too much and may have been about to set up his own criminal empire. They ain't want no competition or loose ends. He had the criminal contacts there for his drugs, for his extortion. And I believe he would have tried to set something up there, recruit, you know, either within the ranks or ex-members of different loyalist paramilitary organisations. I believe he would have tried to start a, another fiefdom. Within days of Gray's killing, a celebrity bonfire was being prepared in nearby Dundonald. That's negative. Most telling of all was the tiny funeral cortege. Gray, a connoisseur of funerals, would have understood. It is almost impossible to find anyone with a good word to say about Jim Gray. It's like, you know, somebody's... Lay in his bed, is, he got to lay in that. You know me? <laughs> me, my opinion still stands strong. I'm telling you, that, that, that cane of coal, that made him a different person. And everybody hated who he became on there. Don't sound like he was ever sober. He was never in this right state of mind. You know, you start doing that, you don't sleep for days and days and days upon a day. So it's like, you might have been a little bit crazy also. And one way it was a relief to me, and another way it wasn't a relief, was I hate to see anybody getting down. Say I lost my grandson and my brain tumour, and uh, it hurt me. <clears throat> but when I seen like a Jim Gray running about, me loss of my grandson. The world doesn't seem right. Pen pal Johnny Adair says Gray's death didn't bother him. To be honest, I, I lost no sleep over it because he done me no favours. He was part and parcel of what happened to my family and my friends. <laughs> there was a time when Jim Gray was stuck to Michael Stone's shoulder, but Gray ended up threatening Stone's life. The former neighbours never resolved a dispute that went back to teenage years. He had the God complex, so to speak. You know, I can order young men who don't want to uh, take life, you know, who don't want to go and beat people up. Uh, I can do that, you know. So he developed that complex, and he developed a complex where he thought he was bigger than loyalism. He thought he was bigger than the UDA. And no one man, as Johnny Adair found out, is bigger than the UDA. I'm glad Big Grey is gone, and maybe one day. When we're both down below, you know, we'll have a chance to sort out that unfinished business. Meanwhile, Anne Tedford faces the prospect of mourning her son at the grave of the man she blames for his death. Well, I don't want his name to go on Jonathan's headstone. If that name's not there, then I feel that I can go see my son talk to my son and if his name was added to the headstone then I don't think I could go. The Love Ulster rally on the Shankill Road last weekend aimed at forging a new unionist unity. Loyalism too is keen to present a new face to the world. There can be no more Jim Grays, no more Jim Grays and loyalism. Loyalism has to move on. 
Law is paramilitaries have to move on. They have to have a say in the future of this country. And they know themselves the only way they're going to do this is by leaving certain baggies behind. Jim Gray, the Brigadier of Bling, left a legacy of death, fear, drugs and criminality. Questions remain, like how were he and his gang able to operate so freely for so long? And will his death really bring an end to criminality in the ranks of the UDA? Time will tell. I don't think it did. All right. Leave comments. Leave a like. I'm gone.